Welcome again, ladies and gentlemen, to the Tawahedo Bible Study Podcast. A member of the Ephesus School Network. In case you have forgotten or not gone to EphesusSchool.org recently, I have the Tawahedo Bible Study on Mondays. We have Father Paul Nadim Tarazi, Tarazi Tuesdays on, you guessed it, Tuesdays. We have Father Aaron Warwick and Jason Everett with Teach Me Thy Statutes on Wednesdays. We have the Bible as Literature with Dr. Richard Benton and Father Mark Bulos on Thursdays. And on Fridays, we have The Way with Father Dustin Lyon. You have no excuse not to read the Bible. We encourage you to read the Bible. But if you so happen to prefer the sound of our voices, here we are reading the Bible to you Monday to Friday in various passages. Although we would prefer that you hear it canonically. And so I'm working on a project with the Greek Orthodox Bible. Pray for me. And I will hopefully have an audio Bible sometime by the end of this year. If not the end of this year, then the end of next year. Unless, of course, the Lord comes. Maranatha, Maranatha. So we will say Lord willing or God willing or inshallah. The third thing I want to say to you before we get into 1 John chapter 3 or the scroll of 1 John chapter 3 is that wherever you are, whichever platform you find yourself listening to my voice on, subscribe, please. That helps it so that more people can hear the living word of God. And then you can share the ideas from this platform. And if you can send it uh, to a loved one, a stranger, an enemy by copying and pasting it or sharing it, whatever the function is on whichever platform you're listening. Finally, if you want to support this ministry, please donate at patreon.com slash Tawahado. Even $5 a month would go a long way. So now we are in First John chapter 3. Today, I'm switching back to the NKJV, the New King James Version. So let's begin with 1 to 3. They give me nice little chapter divisions, which I followed pretty much except for the last set. I combined verse 24 with verses 16. Uh, so anyway, we're on verses 1 to 3. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. Therefore, the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he is pure. Behold is one of these great biblical words. I try to use it in common parlance as much as I can. You're called to look at something. You're called to see something. But it's deceptive because we know the Bible or scripture emphasizes not vision in the earthly sense, but vision in the heavenly sense. Not vision, but hearing. And not just hearing, but hearing with ears that hear. Not with gargoyle ears. Not with your normal statue of a confederate or a statue of a, an imperial monarch of Ethiopia. Not with ears of a lawn gnome or a jockey, but with ears that hear, with a heart of flesh, with an open mind, with a willingness to change your actions, your words, and your thoughts to conform to godly thoughts, godly words, and godly deeds. We're called to behold, to look at, to see not an invisible love that's lovey-dovey, that has feelings that you may write on a Hallmark card for your beloved, I'm sorry to say, but we are called to behold, to look at, to see the visible love that is reflected on the visible people, on physical people, on humankind made in the image and in the likeness of God. We are called to do this based on the hope we have in Jesus' return, what some call the second advent or the second coming. Part two, you could say, or part two. We are called to purify ourselves so that we can be pure like him. We are called to be holy as he is holy, perfect as he is perfect, 
to carry our cross daily, to deny ourselves, to get rid of the old Adam, and to put on the new Adam, Jesus Christ. Verses 4 to 9. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Have you ever been asked if you were born again? I've had various Protestants ask me that question before, and other Orthodox seem to stumble when they're asked that question. I just tell them, yes, I was born again on the 40th day when I had the clergy baptize me in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and read scripture aloud in my name, had a Godfather say that he was willing to raise me in the faith. And through the grace of God, here I am. Does it always work out that way? No. But thank God it did in my case. And I think that it's a better foundation to baptize babies than to not baptize them. Here we are told that we practice righteousness. And when we practice righteousness, we are righteous. For the epistles of John, I've switched up the intro. But the normal intro to the Tohado Bible study is the intro to the Sunday liturgy of the is right. Now, I'm no great singer, but here you go. That's the exact message of the intro to Sunday's liturgy. All who do or who act righteously are righteous. And it adds, and they honor the sabbath so the ones who honor the sabbath the day of rest the day of finding rest in our lord through his scripture through his law through his instruction those people find their rest in practicing practicing righteousness and those are the people who are righteousness we hear the word devil here right from the greek diabolos which means the slanderer so devilishness is God slander. So if God is ask, asking you, not asking you, excuse me, demanding, commanding you to reflect the love that he has in a visible way on all of humankind, then devilishness or being diabolical is whatever that makes you stray from that visible love. So I pray that as we do in our baptismal rite, you agree to destroy the works of the devil, to destroy all works of slander or of God slander and get people on the right path, which means get them to love one another. Verses 10 to 15. In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in in him man this is this has got one of my favorite verses of all of scripture john is telling us the apostle john is telling us he's no longer no longer a zombie he's no longer the walking dead he has passed from death to life how by presenting to you a binary a dichotomy two choices are you a child of god or are you a child of the slanderer do you want to love one another or do you want to hate one another there is no external measurement. Don't talk to me if you're a Greek about the sixth, seventh, or eighth tones. If you're a G'ez, right? Don't talk to me about G'ez, Izil, or Ararai melodies. 
go and reread Genesis or Barashit chapter 4. There you find fratricide, brother murdering brother. And that fratricide extrapolates to all of humankind, to us. It's both functional and instructional. It's applicable and it teaches us. So what was it that was my favorite line? Let me paraphrase here. Do you hate anybody? You're a murderer. The logicians in the audience, as I used to be a logician myself, would say, hey, I think that's a, a logical leap. There's got to be a logical fallacy there. Well, where does logic come from? Logic is from Aristotle. Logic gives you his greatest disciple, Alexander the Great. And of course, Aristotle comes from Plato and Socrates, people who in my college career as an undergraduate, I used to hold in very high esteem. I'd be lying to you if I still, uh, if I told you I still don't like the play Socrates meets Jesus, which is hilarious and I recommend to you as an aside, but we have to take very seriously that Aristotle's top student is Alexander the Great. And we see how he conquered the known world. This Macedonian had world domination or dominion on his mind. And we can say that it's no accident that he learned from Aristotle. This impulse leads you to murder. So I have to ask, do you hate anybody? If so, you're no different than Alexander the great. You gotta love the Apostle John. Verses 16 to the end. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence toward God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. He has given us his spirit so that we can see scripture and interpret it properly. And the proper interpretation of scripture is not in a formula of words, but in a formula of actions. He laid down his life for us with the labor of love that is the crucifixion. In the gospel, according to John, John picks this theme up and says, there is no greater love than this. When we do it, that's great, but we have a little bit less to lose than he did. For Jesus, as it is in Philippians, had more to live for. He had equality with God, but he didn't count it as something that he should take advantage of, as something he should hold or grasp. Instead, he empties himself and takes on the form of a slave. So we need to ask and pray that he reveals this mystery of how to love those whom we hate. How do we love the strangers, the outsiders, the enemies? We need to pray that he reveals his scripture to us so that we too may resemble our Lord Jesus and lay down our lives to one another and every step that is in between. Glory to God for all things.